Perfect. So um, then I'm going to introduce the first, our keynote for today, which is delivered by Philip Singer and Dimitri Gordev, both from H2O AI. And it's a real pleasure to have you here, guys. Um, so I remember your last talk you gave at Vienna R, at, I think it was in December, um, where you introduced the Kaggle competition challenge of NFL, which you won. So these two guys are, I think, the strongest team in Austria, will, um, who are uh, both Kaggle grandmasters. So Philipp Singer is, has a PhD from TU Graz, was previously at Unica and has now joined uh, H2O AI, as well as Dimitri Gordev, who is um, Russian, was previously at RBI, then Unica, and also joined H2O AI. Um, maybe also thanks to the grand uh, Kaggle competitions and the popularity you gained through that. But we are really proud of that. So it's, you know, for Austrian, in Austrian terms, you're the Dominic teams of data science. And Dimitri, please forgive me. So um, in this case, uh, if you're living in Austria and successful, you're automatically being an Austrian. Of course, we know you're Russian. But in this case, we are very proud of you and very happy to have you here and introducing the topic of AutoML, which is gaining lots of popularity in the data science community, um, helping also maybe not so proficient data scientists to come along with complicated problems, also doing prototyping or quick, um, or quick models or tests or benchmarks based on specific data science problems. So we're very happy to have you here. Again, for the audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button and we will answer them either, either right now, right live or at the end at the Q&A session. So again, welcome Philip Singer and Dimitri Gordev. Glad to have you here and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Let me start with uh, sharing the slides. Um, one quick second. So, hello everyone, and uh, we're glad to be able to present to the audience of the conference. Uh, my name is Dmitry Gordiev. Um, I will be presenting together with Philip Singer. Um, we have uh, the first half will be covered by me, then we'll have a switch uh, to Philip. Uh, who will show you uh, a little bit more hands-on things, including uh, a, a live demo. Uh, we both live in Austria, as Mario mentioned. Uh, we both used to work for uh, an insurance company in, in Vienna. Now we moved to uh, become data scientists uh, in the H2O AI. Today's topic is about automated machine learning as quite a hot topic. Uh, recently, this and uh, previous years, I think it only gains popularity and momentum. Um, and we'll try to cover it, um, starting with uh, basic ideas, what stands behind automated machine learning, why we have it, why we're talking about it, why it exists, and then uh, try to go deeper uh, in details, uh, complexities, challenges, how it uh, works to some extent, and where exactly it is um, useful. Uh, but first of all, let me um, share a few words about H2O AI, um, being the company who is um, our current employer, but also one of the most uh, known company for automated machine learning tools. Um, it is first of all known for um, open source product, which also includes an AutoML open source product. So it's literally an AutoML tool you can download from GitHub, try out and see whether um, uh, whether it can uh, bring benefits to your use cases and uh, use it uh, even for your business. Um, but it's also known for a very wide community uh, across the world uh, supporting uh, different products, including AutoML, um, with, the, with the mission for the company to democratize AI for everyone, meaning to uh, 
spread uh, AI as a topic and as a tool set to larger audience in terms of the companies, industries, as well as individuals. Uh, we work with uh, different organizations, including businesses, governments, universities, uh, uh, and we're quite involved even in, in, in some research topics uh, in day-to-day -day activities. Um, who works for the company besides us two? Um, I would like to emphasize the very strong data science team, uh, which includes, uh, I think, 18 Kaggle Grandmasters as of today. Uh, you can see we're nicely spread all over the world, uh, including two of the data scientists uh, in Austria, me, myself and Philip. Um, um, we have more people in Europe nowadays and the team is growing. Um, and these are uh, the people who uh, achieved quite a lot on Kaggle, first of all, Kaggle competitions mainly. Um, me and Philip are among top 10, top 10 Kaggle competitors at the moment. Um, but uh, uh, in H2O, we have two more colleagues who are also in top 10. And one of them, Guan Shou, who is located in New York, is currently Kaggle top one uh, worldwide. Um, why it is important is because we have a lot of people with hands-on experience, not only from um, industries, but also across the main expertise uh, coming from Kaggle competitions. And we're trying to bring this expertise into, uh, into improving products or creating new products, including AutoML products. So, um, this, um, this team basically emphasizes the idea of bringing expert uh, knowledge and expert skills into the tool to automate machine learning in the future. But of course, uh, H2O is not limited by uh, data scientists. We have even way more talented software developers and software engineers distributed across the world who, um, who basically take care of the tools themselves. With regards to the popularity of the of, of the tools in the company uh, as it's perceived by the community in the world. Here are two uh, Gartner Magic Quadrants for, uh, from this year. Uh, one for data science and machine learning platform and the other one is about cloud AI developer services. Uh, you can see that in both quadrants uh, H2AI is claimed to be the visionary uh, and uh, in the data science and machine learning platform we are the worldwide leader, uh, meaning that we're perceived as the company who, uh, who is very strong in the topic and has a very good vision of how the topic is gonna be developing, um, which, which is important for us uh, for today because uh, AutoML is probably the flagship product and the topic of the company and the main strength, uh, strength is on automation. Um, Enough for, uh, for, for the company for, for now. Um, let's switch to uh, closer to the topic and let's start with uh, a few words about AI and uh, uh, eventually to the question why automated machine learning is uh, important. Um, if we look at what, uh, what is happening in the market right now, we can see that AI is, is transforming pretty much every, every industry out there. Uh, there are three big forces driving this transformation. First one is uh, an enormous increase in uh, money spent on AI everywhere. Forrester claims 300% increase in investments year over year. We see increased demand in jobs requiring AI skills. Demand in data scientists is increasing. Uh, and we see upper management uh, seeing um, AI as a strategic topic. Nine out of 10 CIOs are planning to use machine learning for their businesses, regardless of the industry. But what are, what are the challenges right now? Um, we usually put it as three T's. Uh, for the companies, the AI challenges are talent, talent, time, and trust. Talent meaning that there is obviously shortage of uh, skillful people uh, on the market with, uh, with the current pace of the demand growth. Um, so uh, there's a lot of talent needed, but not enough supply at the moment. 
Uh, there's a lack of time because time is a big factor and companies want to have quick answers to the questions with their data or quick prototypes and uh, going through the data, experimenting uh, is a tedious work and can take too much time and sometimes the markets are too dynamic to wait for that much to uh, to provide a, a meaningful insight and valuable model for uh, for, the, uh, for the company to operate. Third, but not least, is a very hot topic of trust in the model because uh, the companies need to put their trust uh, into the predictive and AI models to change their businesses or to improve their businesses. So whatever data scientist produces, it has to be um, understandable, explainable. Uh, it, should be uh, possible for the management to uh, understand why it's working, maybe to some extent how it's working, and therefore gain trust in AI as a product which can bring benefit for their core values and core businesses, um, even core competences as a company. So how does OTML comes into play? What does it bring uh, and how does it help to solve some of these challenges? AutoML stands for automatic machine learning, uh, but how, how is it possible to automate such things? What is possible to automate in the first place and what does it does make sense to automate? Uh, let's start uh, answering these questions by reviewing the basic and the standard uh, terms of the uh, AI lifecycle and uh, the usual um, uh, AI model lifecycle steps. Um, we all, I believe, saw similar pictures uh, with maybe a little bit modified steps and roles involved. But usually, whenever we talk about AI, we, uh, we think about the life cycle of a model, which starts with a business user claiming a need for an, an AI, describing a business use case, uh, which, uh, which then uh, continues with data collection, data exploration, checking, what meaningful data for this use case company owns or can acquire. Um, later, this, this task uh, lands on the table of a data scientist to experiment, try different models, try different approaches to, get, to come up with, um, with a prototype or a fully fledged final model, which is con or she, he or she is confident to bring value to the use case. And uh, then we, we're usually proceeding with uh, the deployment part of the life cycle where we need involvement of uh, DevOps, uh, MLOps, uh, engineers to deploy the model, uh, to test it in production, to manage the life cycle of multiple models uh, if there are multiple models in place. Think about integration of uh, models into the core systems, into the business processes, and of course, monitor uh, the, uh, the applications and check how well uh, the benefit which models bring align with the expectations. Um, model um, uh, AutoML is basically focusing on the tasks uh, around the work of a data scientist. So it's a it's a tool uh, helping to automate the parts of the data scientists, data engineers, and partially mod, uh, DevOps um, roles, which can be automated. What are the challenges we're, we're talking about if we look at the data scientists' day-to-day -day work? What uh, data scientist faces when he received, uh, receives uh, a new task, a new idea uh, coming from a business need? Uh, usually, like uh, there are three pillars of the work, which are feature engineering, working with the data, exploring it, uh, which start with like basic things uh, like encoding features. So bringing everything to the shape uh, uh, that is consumable by machine learning algorithm. There can be advanced techniques. Uh, there can be industry uh, specific features generated or some prior knowledge needed to understand what the data is about. Um, first of all, it's a time-consuming process. Uh, probably most of the time developing the model is spent on exploring and uh, enhancing the data. It requires quite a, skill, uh, quite a, skill, a skill set and some experience in that. 
um, uh, and um, as the result, uh, uh, data scientist gets more insight there and more uh, ways to improve the future model. But the model building itself is also uh, quite a time consuming task. Uh, whoever tried different approaches and tried different tuning of the algorithms know that it's time consuming and sometimes quite a repetitive tasks. Um, it also requires knowledge of the, uh, of the topics beside that uh, and some creativity to create ensembles of the models, which is the most uh, modern way to get the most accuracy out of the uh, machine learning algorithms. And last but not least, we're talking about model deployment. So creating a, a pipeline of the model, which will go to production or in a prototype environment. Uh, model explainability uh, for the upper management or for the business uh, case owner to explain how it works and why it works. And model documentation, which is always a topic for, uh, especially for regulated, reg uh, for regulated industries such as financial services. Uh, all these things are quite time consuming, uh, but uh, you already can see that there is quite a potential to automate several things uh, with potential benefit of, uh, if possible, having the uh, flexibility to also have uh, manual interventions and, uh, uh, and manual, ad manual add-ons to certain steps. Um, what do people usually uh, mean when, when they say AutoML. They usually mean um, a method to automate model selection and hyperparameter optimization with the twofold goal. First one, to improve the efficiency of finding, uh, finding the optimal model, meaning to efficiently go through the iterations data scientists usually do uh, when picking the best model. But also the second one is uh, with uh, high level of automation, we can bring actually non-experts to the table and allow non-experts to train uh, quite a high level uh, quality models uh, uh, using AutoML tools. But AutoML is also um, um, evolving itself. Uh, let's first talk about how it appeared in the first place. Uh, probably this is uh, one of the first pictures uh, which comes in mind uh, when, you, uh, when you ask ourselves where did AutoML came from. We start with the computer programming as the way to automate some basic repetitive steps. Um, and uh, recently uh, there was a large and still is going a large boom on, of machine learning as the ways to, uh, as the tool set to automate decision-making process or automating the business processes which involve decisions. With machine learning, we also automate uh, uh, certain evaluations and certain decisions which previously were done manually. And AutoML is even a step further. It's an attempt to automate more complicated things so automate machine learning, which itself is a way to automate things. So uh, we're looking at automation of an automation tool. Within the AutoML, um, we try to split uh, the approaches into several generations of the approaches, which goes in line with, um, with probably how most of the data scientists see it. Uh, because uh, at the first generation, uh, automation usually involves, uh, inv involves automating such tedious and repetitive tasks as feature encoding, hyperparameter tuning, uh, assembling the models and picking up the best model. So these are the things which involve probably the least intervention by a data scientist. At the second generation, we, we think of uh, uh, about advanced feature engineering. So here are the, the powerful uh, mechanism of creating derivative features can bring uh, quite a lot of value. Um, and uh, we also mentioned model explainability being an important topic to bring the models into life. With the third generation, uh, it is a vertical solution with automated also data augmentation uh, and custom uh, and wide tools of customization. So whenever we see that the default parameterization doesn't work for RML, 
we need to bring some uh, expertise into play and customize certain steps. What does it um, mean in terms of the technical steps of the machine learning workflow? Um, let's look at, at an example of a typical machine learning workflow with a lot of blocks involved. So if we split it into smaller tasks, we start with the training data, we explore it, prepare it, shape it up, and then put it into large uh, block, uh, which iteratively usually generates features, uh, picks different machine learning algorithms, optimizes high, high parameters of those, puts them together or picks the, uh, and then picks the, the best ensemble, tries to explain it, validate it, uh, and uh, report the results of its performance. Uh, and after every part of these um, of this block is done, we're ready to do model engineering, meaning converting the model into a uh, proper um, either uh, either language which will be used for deployment or package it in say Docker image and so forth. And after that, we're pushing it to uh, DevOps to deploy the model in the real life system, in the core system, uh, and monitor uh, the prediction and potentially monitor explanations of the predictions the model is making. So uh, which are the steps we are able to, uh, to automate nowadays? Quite a lot if you think about that, if you think about, um, about these blocks. If we start with exploring and preparing the data, this is, uh, this is uh, quite uh, a complicated task which obviously cannot be fully automated, but there are a lot of steps which are repetitive and can be, can be easily done by, by an AutoML tool, such, ex such as preparing data in the needed format, uh, encoding, more complicated techniques which are also repetitive if you think about image processing or NLP tasks, a lot of those things can be taken over and uh, save time of the data scientist and save time to produce prototypes. Within the main block, there are a lot of, uh, there are basically everything which can be either automated or even more than that, automated with possibility to be extended. Tuning the models, fitting the models, assembling the models, as well as feature engineering uh, and picking the machine learning algorithm. An AutoML tool is not uh, a black box which does only a fixed, uh, fixed set of uh, steps and goes through the fixed set of features or machine learning algorithms. It's something which can be extended for your needs. Uh, last but not least, uh, model explainability and automated reporting the models is also something which modern AutoML tools are doing pretty much in automated, uh, almost fully automated in this regard. Because the reports which are produced for regulators are usually standardized, standardized and uh, they're delivered by, uh, by an AutoML tool in the desired format. Model explanations provide good uh, deep insights in how uh, one can expect model to behave in certain situation, explain the dependencies models found, and even uh, to interpret some of the parts of the model whenever needed. And of course, model engineering, wrapping up a model into a packageable format is, uh, is without a doubt a, a part of an AutoML tool. So from this perspective, we're covering pretty much on 90, 80 to 90% of the steps data scientist is, is working and AutoML can provide automation pretty much for uh, partial or fully pretty much for every step of a data scientist daily job. Now I'm gonna hand over uh, to Philip to uh, give you a little bit more details and um, examples of, uh, of a practical approaches for AutoML and practical use cases. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you, Dimitri, for handing it over to me and giving such an su such a great great introduction to what AutoML is about. And I want to really give you 
a quick overview of the current landscape of AutoML and also um, give you a short demo of how, such, how, how something like that can work in practice. And I want to show this on one of our tools called driverless AI. So AutoML is not a new thing. Um, it has been going on for a couple of years, maybe even 10 years that people have tried to try to optimize things. And as Dimitri mentioned, this is a very natural step when you have something that you try to automate aspects of it. Um, maybe some of you who are using Python know scikit-learn. Scikit-learn is a very popular uh, library to run your machine learning models. And there is like around 2015, there was some starting to some development in ter for um, called auto, auto scikit-learn. And this is really what Dimitri also mentioned as first gen. So automize feature selection, automize model fitting, model selection, and automize hyperparameter tuning using some kind of Bayesian optimization technique. This is an open source solution, which is quite similar to Teapot um, emerging at the same time, which is using an evolutionary algorithm to do similar things. Autokeras is coming from the deep learning world. So Keras is a very popular deep learning framework, and there is also Autokeras very, for example, can try to fit the image classifier, so more focusing on this aspect. In the, in, in the proprietary world, there's also a data robot offering solutions, and also, of course, the big players are playing a role. So there is Google's AutoML and Amazon SageMaker. Those are just examples, there are many more. And they also try to offer solutions for automated machine learning, um, more, most prominently in terms of APIs or, or, or in SageMaker, and they also have great solutions. Um, we from H2O, we have basically two products. So one of our solutions is a complete open source um, machine learning framework, which we call H2O3. Um, is it, it is mostly um, a library that can accelerate your machine learning approaches in terms of Spark. Um, so it is very, fast machine learning solution. And there we have also, there we have um, um, also an auto automated machine learning part in it. Um, so in our open source solution, there is an uh, auto ML um, aspect that everyone can use. And we also have H2O driverless AI, which is really a solution just focusing on this automated machine learning aspect. And this is the solution I want to um, focus a bit more now in order to give you really a quick overview or a quick intro to how something like that works in practice. So driverless AI, we call it first of all driverless because it should really give you this driverless experience. Um, it is built up like a cockpit and we will see it. And we call it a platform to make your own AI. And we focus exactly on all those points already mentioned throughout this presentation. So how can we accelerate um, the number of experiments we, we run? Because this is a very important aspect of data science, that you run experiments, you refine experiments, you um, reshape your business problem maybe a bit, and you run experiments again. So this iterative process, um, also the runtime of experiments, how many things can we do simultaneously at the same time, so time and speed, but keeping the accuracy very, very high. Um, in the beginning of this uh, presentation, Dimitri also mentioned that we have a lot of talent in, 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 in the call, uh, in, the, in, the, in the company, and all of this or everyone brings in some kind of expertise and we try to improve the product continuously in order to get the, the most state-of-the-art solutions and um, really bolster the accuracy. We have this whole end-to-end approach so from starting from 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 starting from the the data going really into uh, model fitting feature engineering into also deployment in the end and we have this whole important x aspect of explainability interpretability which is an integral part of automated machine learning uh, solutions uh, in, in gen 3. So how does it work? And I will show this to you in a second in practice, but just from start to finish, you bring your data, 
you bring your data either through a CSV file. We have a lot of connectors to, for example, S3, Snowflake, etc. And then also some kind of automated parts start. Um, it, it doesn't start at the modeling, but it starts at the data exploration. So we give you already overviews of correlations between features, um, outliers, um, the general data overview, automated visualization, and so on and so forth. Then we have this whole functionality of automatic model optimization and also offer you to bring your own recipes. So you can bring your own, for example, you have a feature engineering technique you wanna introduce in this whole pipeline, you can just upload a script and use it. And then also when models are fitted, we have automated scoring pipelines with deployment ready solutions and a lot of stuff about machine learning interpretability. So let me, let me um, start up a, a video that I have recorded, which is um, just a very quick overview of how something like that could work. And here you can already see our platform, um, black screen, black form, white text. I hope everyone can see it. And we have, um, I have uploaded here two CSV files, um, split in train and test data set already up front which is from a credit card uh, use case where the task is to predict um, whether a customer will default within the next month. So you have um, historic payments of a customer and you want to predict um, whether he or she will default next month. So you can see here, I have uploaded these two CSV files and I can go into details. So these details already gives you an overview, very quick um, overview of the data. What are the columns? How are the individual columns distributed? How many unique values do we have per columns? What is min, max, mean, and so on and so forth. And you can scroll through the columns and get a feeling. And as the last column here, we have the target, which is default payment next month. We can see we have zero or one. So it's a classification task, binary classification task with um, uh, an imbalance towards non-defaults. Makes sense. More people do not default than those that default. We can also go on top to data set rows where you can um, just as a data table get an overview of, of how, how the data looks like uh, row by row. Then we would have functionality for visualiza visualization, not showing this too much in, in detail now, but um, I already gave you a hint before. We have uh, outlier visualizations, correlation plots, um, data distribution plots, and so on and so forth. But let us go, let us go to the important part, um, which is prediction. So here you start with um, now starting an experiment to predict your task at hand. You can give it a name, yeah, just the experiment has a name. And we can select the target column that we want to predict, which is in this case, default payment next month. So let us select that. And then we can also on top right, select the test data set. Um, I have already split it this before, so we can select credit card test here. This has no overlap to the training data. And be aware that driverless AI is not touching this test data set at all to do any kind of model fitting. It is just there in the end to evaluate your model on a complete holdout data set. So it gives you predictions for that and it um, calculates the metric for it. Next, we need to select the score, which is the, um, the, the metric we are interested in. And we have a few of options here. You can extend that with your own metrics um, for a binary classification task. Now for a demo, it is very suitable to use area under the curve. So we will leave this as default. And then we have these three knobs of accuracy, time and interpretability. And let me try to explain each of these ones um, very quickly. So accuracy means, and everyone you can select from one to 10. Accuracy means um, that uh, can give you a rough estimate of how complex the models, uh, the, the model splits will be done. So you, driverless AI will do validation splits on, its, on itself. And the higher you set it, the more validation splits. So the more confidence you can have in the validation accuracy that you get and the more generalizable it might be. So it says also here, higher values should lead to higher confidence in model performance. 
but it has a bit of a trade-off with, with um, runtime. Also time is another runtime setting you can give, which is how many iterations in the experiment are run, how many models are, for example, fit, or when is early stopping done in model fitting and so on and so forth. And the final one is um, interpretability. And we do a lot. So what we automize a lot is feature engineering. So we build very partly very complex features that we try out in, in the, in the um, AutoML algorithm. Um, so, but complex features have kind of a trade-off with interpretability. So the more complex a feature, the less you can interpret it. So we have this trade-off between interpretability and complexity of features. So for example, five is a fair trade-off. And here you can see that um, on the left-hand side, you can see the feature engineering search space. So these are all the types of feature engineering that we do in this experiment. So for example, uh, target encoding, running SVD on top of features to, to or one hot encoding um, and so on and so forth. If you don't care about interpretability, you could set this to one and the most complex features will be tried. Maybe this can help with accuracy. And we have a lot, so these are just the basic settings that usually can get you started very quickly. And we have a lot of expert settings. So you can really tailor the whole experiment towards your own needs. You can select um, different types of models that you want to try. So here is just an example of the models we have, like all the gradient boosted um, trees, like light GBM, XGBoost, PyTorch model, um, GLMs, and so on and so forth. And you can select here already what you even want to try. If it's auto, the AutoML tool will select on itself which ones it will try. Features, you can do a lot of feature settings, like what types of feature transformations do you want to allow? We have a lot of functionality for time series because time series is really a very common use case in, um, in business. And here you have to adhere to a lot of things like lag feature generation, um, proper settings of the validation splits you never want to train on future data and so on and so forth. We also have state-of-the-art NLP models, BERT models, um, Roberta models. So you can put in your text, run a model all out of the box. We have solutions for image, uh, uh, all the state-of-the-art image net models um, and all these recipes where you can customize your experience. So let us start the experiment with the default settings. So what happens now is that in the beginning, driverless AI will do a lot of additional checks that are also very important when you run an experiment, but are also sometimes very tedious to do your, on your own. So like, which are the constant columns you should drop? Or is there a column that has a leak to the target? This is very risky because your experiment might be very leaky and might show a high accuracy, even though you just forgot to remove an ID or you have a feature that is very predictive of, of the target, you might want to consider to remove this um, because this might not be a reasonable feature. So again, it, give, it gives you warnings. It also checks, for example, for um, data shift or change from train to test. So all these different things which are important before you run an experiment to check on the data. You can always also click here on the log and you get very detailed um, what is currently happening within the experiment. So here we can already see that it detected a possible shift between training and test for these two features, pay amount and, um, the, and the gender, um, but only very slight shift. You can decide on your own if, you, if this can be problematic or not. And then um, it will start here to show information in a second about the iteration on the left hand side and variable importance in the in the center. So iteration is each model that is fit and how the current score for this model is and what is the current variable importance. This whole experiment, like the whole thing will finish within three minutes, but um, to, to save some time, I have already finished this beforehand. So we will um, switch in a second to the already finished experiment. But here you can see on the right hand side, it ran three minutes 30, the whole experiment. So if we click here, we can already see the finalized results. 
it ran for all these iterations. It ended up with an, with an AOC of 078 roughly. Here in the, and all of these are different models fitted, different iterations of the evolutionary algorithm. And um, we mostly fit here, um, we saw before, light GBM gradient boosted models are selected as best ones. Here in the center, we can see the variable importance. And on the right hand side, we can see all the summary statistics of the experiment. So for example, here in this experiment, very tiny data ran within three minutes 30. Um, actually not so tiny data. We have 24,000 rows and 25 original features. Um, we scored 280 different features out of which we selected 20 in the end. Um, so just imagine you would sit probably a couple of days um, to think of all the feature engineering you could do here to think about what type of features to try them out. So this is really taking a lot of the work away. Um, and we also ran in this short time, uh, 16 models were overall trained. And you can see on the bottom, the final validation score. And on the holdout test data set, we get a very, very nice AOC of 0.8. So even higher than the validation score. So this generalizes really well. And here in the center, we have now all these other options, which kind of fit into this whole AutoML pipeline. So you can deploy directly this fitted model here, locally or in the cloud. Out of the box, score, um, new records. Yeah. Then the second thing is very important for us, uh, interpretability. So we have a lot of stuff and I would probably need a couple of hours to show you everything here, but we have uh, state-of-the-art Shapley values. We have surrogate models. We have other summary statistics. You can look really into detail of individual data points, try to understand um, uh, you can score on other data sets, you can download the predictions, and we, you can even download whole Python scoring pipeline and a Mojo, which is a Java, um, Java container, which you could directly deploy in your um, business uh, IT. We also have solutions for R, um, so you can, you can use these scoring pipelines anywhere. And we have what we call um, an auto report, um, which is a very long Word document, basically, giving you all the details of this experiment. So all, all the details, what features have been tried. So it, you have a full documentation of, of the experiment. Yeah, so this is just a, um, a very quick overview of the experience of our driverless AI tool and how AutoML basically works. So really just what we did is we loaded the data there and then we set up the experiment and, and the tool did a lot of the work that, that is tedious and um, that takes away. And, and in the end, we get really strong accuracy. We have all the options for deployment and, um, and yeah, here again, the overview of the experiment. So just as a, as a, as a last slide, um, we have seen in the past of our experience, a lot of successful AutoML use cases, and probably you guys know best um, what, what, what kind of um, use case is interesting to you, but there is no limit uh, in general. So financial services, the whole fraud detection, we have done a lot, um, uh, credit risk scoring, healthcare and life sciences. We have also done quite a lot with COVID lately. Um, there's even stuff like flu season prediction, uh, telecom, predictive maintenance, marketing and retail, um, the whole thing about cross-selling, upselling, uh, customer churn. So all those use cases fit AutoML usually very well. And with that, um, thank you everyone. If there are any questions, maybe we have time now. Um, otherwise, also feel free to contact us anytime. Check out our website. Um, we are always also happy to give a longer demo. This was a very short, short demo, but feel free to get in contact with us and um, we are always happy, happy to connect. So thank you, Philip. Thank you very much for, and Dimitri for your great keynote and insight to AutoML. Um, Time has already progressed a bit, but I would like to ask a few questions from the audience. 
So by Ilya Iklyakov, how does automated interpretation of automatically generated features work? Mm -hmm. I can take this one. Uh, first of all, uh, we, depending on the industry, some of the features have to, sometimes the features have to be really easy interpretable and we're usually doing it by just limiting the feature engineering to something which can be straightforward interpreted. Or if it's not that strict to introduce some constraints, so features are monotonic and so forth. Um, if it's not that stringent, then we're, um, uh, we are providing descriptions of the generated features. Think about like targeted encoding of the features, encoding of the nominal features, stuff like this. Uh, and also in the end, we were focusing not only on individual features, but like overall contribution, because one variable can end up in multiple aggregated derivative features, uh, kind of co-influencing the final model. For this stuff, we do the typical statistical approach uh, as partial dependency plots. So you see how changes in, in one uh, raw variable uh, changes the, the predictions, but also supplies surrogate models meaning that models which are uh, giving similar predictions to the final model, but which are either easy explainable like a decision tree or fully interpretable like a linear or logistic regression. Because also to me, it seemed actually that the feature generation pro process is very complex and combines lots of different models. And so comparing it to actually the final classification model in this case, where is more complexity involved in the feature generation or in the final model? That, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm leaning towards saying a little bit more in feature generation because it's an, an iterative process. And for some tasks, uh, you want to cross different types of the variables. And this is what AutoML tools are good for. Uh, to save time to try all different combinations. But uh, we shouldn't forget that modeling uh, is also uh, quite a lot of work. You need to go through a bunch of different methods. Uh, for each method, you need to optimize the parameters and then put together uh, best models to create an ensemble which performs better than each individual one. Okay, so 50-50 or? No, maybe 60-40, I, I would say. 60-40. Yeah. Okay, so by anonymous, what is a data shift? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mentioned that. So data shift means, for example, when you imagine you have some kind of kind of kind of feature. So, for example, let's say age of customer or something like that, and you suddenly have a complete change in how the feature is distributed. So, let's say you train your model only on customers between twenty and thirty and you, you suddenly have in production uh, customers that um, are above 30, uh, 50 or something like that. Or the whole distribution of the feature completely shifts over time. And then the model might work poorly because it is more constrained in the fitting process to a certain distribution of the feature. And if that changes um, in your actual inference or production step, then this can be problematic. So what happens here, for example, is that we automatically try to detect in time series problems whether a certain feature um, shifts over time. So changes significantly across time. Or um, if you have a training or test set, like we saw in this case, we check from training to test if there is a complete distribution uh, difference um, between train and test. Okay, thanks. By Gerhard, another question is, um, how is data preparation partially automated? Could you please elaborate and give some examples? Data preparation starts with like basic steps you have to do, like convert all the data to numeric formats, uh, handle missing values, handle outliers. So some things uh, uh, without doing, uh, which you cannot even run the machine learning algorithm or you run it, but it fails. Uh, but also uh, we're talking about finding and applying transformations to the features. So if you're predicting um, a monetary feature, probably you want to do log transfer of the target. You want to explore if some predictors uh, require log transformation or transformation to uh, normalize the distribution or uh, remove skewness of the distribution, st stuff like this. 
um, for NLP tokenization, cleaning the text, application of embeddings, if you're doing glove embedding or, or well, uh, everything around BERT uh, to, to actually allow it to run. For images, uh, reading the images from different formats, uh, reshaping the images to the same size, uh, and wide range of augmentations, which you can do. And we're also okay. mentioning data augmentation as a technique here, because if your data contains the region, then you might want AutoML tool to automatically pick up, I don't know, macroeconomical data for this region and add it to the data set, stuff like this. And now okay. we're reaching like a thin line between data preparation and data and feature engineering, which, which is yeah, a whole different topic. Okay, cool. Thanks. I also, we are also getting now new questions in, but I have maybe a few typical end questions. So one is maybe a quick one. Um, do you see AutoML as a competitor in Kaggle competitions or how would it score? Would it be a grandmaster in your opinion? Uh, luckily not. Uh, the main... <laughs> The main uh, benefit of the AutoML is the speed. So what we want to achieve is not be top one in a competition, but to be top 50 within minutes or hours. Okay, so like if you compare it to Jess, if it would be a, a quick blitz shock or something, you would actually not have a chance against AutoML, I guess. Yeah, okay. yeah something like this, yeah. Regarding data scientists, if you're now an aspiring data scientist, maybe you have some job fears because there is now this driverless AI and AutoML and maybe this even performs better than your models. So do data scientists have to fear this kind of tool or how would they integrate it best into their workflows? Um. I don't think there needs to be any any fear. Um, I mean, we are data scientists ourselves, uh, even though we work for an AutoML company. But, but in general, I think it takes it takes just away a lot of the tedious work um, that a data scientist does. And but it, a data scientist can still bring a lot of value to running these type of experiments because there is still sometimes. Um, some something that you can bring in yourself in terms of feature engineering, like um, some some domain specific feature engineering can always boost your model a lot. And this is something that an AutoML tool will be really capable of doing. Um, otherwise, um, also how you set up the experiment, um, what is your target, what is the metric you want to really optimize. Um, taking this iterative step like, oh, we detect the shift, oh, we detect the leakage, um, what do I do with it? Um, taking, taking even AutoML as a good baseline sometimes. Like um, if you want to initialize something in your company, you, you're good with a very good result. But then as soon as you've generated a lot of um, business value, you, you might want to get one, two more percent out of it. And then a lot of the, the manual work can bring some more value to it. But it, okay. I think generally it makes you very, it makes you much faster to, to work and it can really supplement your daily daily work and for sure it's a good baseline to have which exactly. can be optimized very last question because it's a discussion i also had with some also data scientists and yesterday martin musler also mentioned it because um there's some uh, lots of people who don't consider current AI as actually intelligent because they say, okay, there's lots of data involved. This data has to be there. Uh, then you just train the machines on it and they spit out some nice optimization based on it. So what would you answer those people or what would be the next steps so that um, maybe this AI would, you know, live on its own or have some more general way of understanding the world because for now it's very limited to the data set you have for sure and so you get some optimized model out of it but what do you think would be the next steps or is it actually achievable i don't know well, usually we use AI not to not as a way to uh, understand the world around it. So we narrow it down to a very, very specific problem. 
and try to check if the data is sufficient to uh, find a good way to solve this problem fast. Sometimes it's not about solving it better than human does. Sometimes it's about solving it um, a little bit worse, but much faster. All models are wrong, but a lot of them are useful. And uh, maybe at certain point, AI will, will be uh, performing some of the tasks better than human do. But at this point, we can already recognize the benefit of having an AI algorithm replacing some of this decision-making things. And we're talking about- Given like, the data set, given exactly. that we have the data set. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, bringing basically the value of the data into a way of like automated decision making. It might be worse than human does, but it's, it's objective, it is automated, uh, it is fast, it is improvable with the data, um, and it is to quite a large extent interpretable. So um, yeah, Be besides that, some of the people are using AI and models as the way to uh, learn some, something from the data, not replacing what they're doing, but like, um, learning something they didn't know out of just pure numbers they collected over the years in their data. Okay, so with that words, I again would like to thank you, Dimitri and Philip, for having a, being here and doing this great keynote presentations. For all the rest of the questions, please send them directly to Dimitri and Philip or to us and we forward them. Um, the next talk will be by wait a sec, by Dragan, who uh, is doing security predictions, wisdom of the crowds. For that, you need to use the different Zoom link you've also received through email. Again, thanks, Dimitri. Thanks, Philip. And hope to see you soon. And um, yes, and just enjoy the rest of the conference. And yeah. Thank you. See Stay you. safe. And thank you for having us. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye.